Ah, it's time to chill out and get ready for a mediocre Q&A live stream. If you're old enough, grab yourself your favorite adult <coughs> beverage. And if you're not, stick with apple juice. Put your feet up and relax. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. And now let's cue up the intro music. It's my cue to talk. What is up, everybody? Welcome to the HVACR videos live stream. As usual, you're stuck with me, Chris. I'm the host. It is what it is. Sorry. Don't mean to offend. Don't mean to disappoint. But here I am, and it is what it is. I got to say thank you very much to everybody out there that's listening and watching this that subscribes to the YouTube channel and follows along. There's a lot of regulars inside the YouTube chat right now. It's amazing to see a lot of familiar screen names. I can't say familiar faces because that wouldn't be true. It's familiar screen names. Some of you I've met. Some of you I have not met. Some of you I probably, you know, you may not want me to meet you because I might be mean. I might be not the person you expect, right? I could be just this total jerk that nobody likes. Maybe I put on a persona and everybody thinks I'm a nice guy, but I'm not. I'm truly just a mean, mean-spirited person. You know, who knows? I don't know. I got no idea. You know, what's funny, though, like one of my best friends of all things, uh, one of his family members completely dislikes me. And that family member has never met me, just have seen me on the HVAC overtime show and just genuinely does not like me. I can't win with some people. I just can't, you know, and my personality is probably not the easiest to get along with. So welcome to the stream hello everybody if you guys don't already know why you're here well this is the hvacr videos live stream this is a way for me to answer questions like you know repetitive questions and then new questions that are in the chat and different things right so uh i put up a couple videos a week usually and then these streams are just a way to kind of consolidate the questions i, I answer some in the chat but majority of them that are like the same questions over and over again um, I just kind of answer here because instead of typing it out, you know, four times, it's easier just to bring it up over in here. So when you guys do put questions in the videos, comments, different things, I try to get to them and I have friends that help me out too, going through them. Uh, it's difficult though. It's difficult to get to everything. So 
you know, if I don't, and this kind of goes across the board for any kind of content creators. If you reach out to a content creator, don't feel like you're being ignored just because they don't answer a comment or an email. Uh, you know, there's a lot. I'm not even a big content creator and there's a ton of emails and comments and there's no way I could get to them all. The best advice I can give to you if you want to get a hold of me, if you have a question or something like that, is just keep sending me an email. I don't care if you resend it, right? Just just keep sending it because sometimes emails just get buried in my inbox. Um, if you have something you want me to address, just send it to me, hvacrvideos at gmail.com. And uh, if I don't answer it in a timely fashion, send it again. Just, just a reminder, you know? And I'll try to get to it eventually. Uh, sometimes it can be just difficult, right? Trying to live a normal life and run businesses and do all that different stuff, it can be a little difficult. So, But hello to everybody that's in the chat right now. Um, okay, Mike B says, when he met me in Atlanta, I was just like I was here. That's good to know. See, there we go. Mike, is, uh, is that a face mask? Damn it, you got me, Neil. It's a face mask. I'm completely fake. No, I'm confused. What what do you mean as a face mask? Is there something behind me that looks like a face mask? Or are you asking if I have a face mask on because I'm fake? I don't know. Um, let's see. But that's good to know, Mike, that I was the person you expected to meet. That's that's a good thing, right? Uh, have I ever seen an Eco Blue blower under amp by like three amps? Brian Sanders. Mm, that's a good question. No, not really. Uh, the Eco Blue are ECM motors. They're axial vein motors, I believe. And uh, they're they're just like a you know carrier or whoever their parent company is. Their parent company is still United Technologies. I don't know. I don't know who the parent company of carrier is these days, but they use it in all their iterations of package units. It's their eco-friendly indoor blower motor, right? It's a giant axial fan motor. Uh, and you got to set the speed on it by using the dip switches and by using the little pointometer on there and adjusting it based on the static pressure to get the proper airflow that you need. So have I ever seen one that under amped by like three amps? Not really. I mean, I'm, I'm curious if you tried to turn it up. So you're saying maxed out it's under amping. That's interesting. That's very interesting. No, never seen that before. So, um, Dennis said he thought I was AI. Ooh, that'd be scary. Do you think that AI could possibly replicate me? Never mind. No, just don't even listen to what I just said. Everybody that heard it and got ideas in their heads, just keep it to yourself. All right. Um, I went down a path that I don't want to go down right now. So Randy says, can a restricted supply duct decrease the airflow on a package unit? Yeah, most definitely. And or, uh, Randy, it definitely could. Uh, your duct work is, you know, the easiest way for people that don't completely understand it is to think of it as your blood vessels, right? And, uh, you know, you're trying to pump blood through your veins, right? And it just can't get through them. They're, they get clogged up or they get restricted and the blood's not flowing the way that it's supposed to be. It's very similar with airflow. If you have a restricted supply duct, then it's going to affect everything. If you have a restricted return duct, it's going to affect everything, right? It all works together in the big picture, so. Um, you think the answer is yes. Yeah. Let's not do that one. Okay. So, uh, where should I go to read or listen to the new laws for the future of refrigerants? David says, boy, that is a loaded question. So let's just put this here. If you can think of some cockamamie scheme, some new thing to do with refrigerants, I can guarantee you it's already been thought of and it's already a law in the next five years. Okay. Uh, let's just think about it this way. Every refrigerant that we are using right now is on the chopping block, right? Uh, at one point or another, that refrigerant is out the door, right? We're just phasing in A2Ls in the United States here. Uh, Europe is in the process of phasing out some of the A2Ls because they don't meet their criteria anymore. We're a little bit behind on the refrigeration regulations here in the United States. So, you know, the A2Ls that we're just phasing in, the R32 and the 454B and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, that one, they're all being phased out, okay? They're all being phased out. There's a new flavor of refrigerant coming every single day. That is why it is so important for us technicians to, number one, not be afraid of change, and number two, to understand the refrigeration science as best as possible, right? to understand temperatures and the proper operation of the system because there's always going to be a new refrigerant. You can't get used to like what pressures this refrigerant runs. The pressures are irrelevant. Look at temperatures, learn the proper operation of the system, 
figure out how they designed it for the evaporator TD, the, uh, the condenser TD, and then work your way through it with the new refrigerants. Okay, so it's so important. But is there a one consolidated place to go to? I mean, um, the ESCO Institute uh, does a good job of putting out lots of good refrigerant training. Jason Objut is in charge of, I believe, regulations and different things. So Jason does put out a lot of good content. Ty Branneman also works for the ESCO Institute. So he's always, you know, pushing out new information also the same. So uh, I would follow anything associated with the ESCO Institute. You could probably, that'll be a good start to understand the regulations. Look at some of the other uh, governing organizations within the HVAC industry like ACA. Um, that's another good one to follow. And, you know, those are some pretty trusted resources and they tend to do a good job of finding out the needed information. So that way we can understand it a little bit better. The one thing I will say is be very, very careful trusting just anything you read on the internet, internet and or just anything that you hear from the supply house counter, okay? Supply houses can give you good information, but just like a YouTuber or content creator like myself, you can get bad information from myself or from another content creator too. So it's always important that just because you read it doesn't mean it's gospel. You need to make sure that you do some research, fact check it. Um, and that's something that's very important in this day and age. There's a lot of misinformation on the internet and you need to know how to decipher through it. You can't just trust one resource. You got to do some research on your own. Okay. So that's my two cents on the matter. Uh, Jordan says, have I used the air duct calculator slider things for manual N? My gosh, I have not picked up an air duct calculator in many years. Uh, no, I can't say that I have. I don't do enough design work to be opening up the ACA manuals. Uh, I did a little bit of work on my house, but I really didn't do a lot of the calculations and stuff when I, when we were designing the system, I really relied on my buddy, Adam Muffich, uh, to help me with the design and stuff. So he kind of figured everything out for me. Um, but no, I don't use, uh, slide rules very much at all. Uh, most of the work that I do is refrigeration and air conditioning service work. I'm not for the most part redesigning duct systems on a regular basis and i'm not designing systems from the ground up on a regular basis so full disclosure right is it illegal to pee on the roof mr green asks uh, i'm sure that you can get an indecent exposure i'm sure that there's some kind of law that you can get for peeing on the roof um, i'm sure you can get in trouble for something right um you know yeah i'm sure i'm sure it's it's some corn kind of a rule right all right, let's see what else we got going on in the chat. Uh, okay, so Josh says that he loved the recent video and loves the content and love watching every single video. Well, th that's very nice. I'm flattered by that, Josh. Thank you very much, my good friend. Um, let's see. Uh, everything HVACR, that's Steve. Steve says he's full of bad information. So am I. So am I. You and I both, Steve. We're on the same page here. <laughs> All right. Uh, do I have any experience working for hospitals? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Uh, did a stint working with the hospital as one of their preferred vendors for probably about eight years where I was doing, uh, medication refrigerators. I was doing a lot of full at symphony ice machines. If you guys are familiar with hospital work, um, navigating, you know, all the different corridors and, uh, satellite locations. Yeah. Did a lot of hospital work. Like I said, for a good solid eight years, I was doing hospital work. So, um, I don't do any hospital work anymore. It was good and bad. It was very lucrative. You can make very good money doing it, but it was a high stress environment. Lots of, uh, you know, 911 emergencies all the time as a running the business. It was a little bit difficult for me to work with hospitals because, you know, sometimes you would get a call for something that, you know, is like a, a, a seriously critical item. And then you'd send a technician out there that, you know, maybe they weren't 100% well versed in that. So then it was just basically I was out on almost every call because they had a very, very high expectation and money was not an issue when I worked for a hospital customer, right? M mind you, full disclosure, I was a contractor working as a preferred vendor for the hospital, right? So they had me doing all the maintenance on, you know, a couple hundred ice machines, a couple hundred refrigerators, and then all the service work too. So uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was good and bad. Let's just say that. So, uh, you know, when, when we parted ways with the customer, um, I was bummed, but then at the same time, it was kind of a relief, uh, cause it was guaranteed that you'd get called out on every holiday, um, to go do work. And it was just kind of a bummer sometimes. So, uh, let's see what else we got going on here. What are some tips for someone who is interested 
in HVAC as a career. HVAC is a great fun trade if you make it fun. You can also make it stressful. You can also make it difficult, okay? Um, it's so important to, to basically, you need to do research. You need to understand it's not anybody else's duty to train you. You have to take the initiative and seek out training. Sometimes your employer pays for it. Sometimes you got to front the cost. They'll reimburse you. It just depends. Inevitably, though, if you go to training and you gain knowledge, that knowledge is yours to keep forever. Nobody can take that knowledge from you. So as a technician, especially a new technician in the trades, I implore you to take any opportunity to gain new knowledge. If your company's willing to send you out on a training for something like that, take it, take it, take it, take it. All the knowledge is better than none of the knowledge, right? Or, or you know, any knowledge is better than no knowledge, essentially. So it's always important as a new guy. This is a great trade. There's a lot of potential, a lot of possibilities. You just have to put in the hard work. This is a, a tough trade. You know, it's physically demanding. Uh, you got to look out for yourself. You got to look out for your employer, your customers, all that good stuff. But it's a it's a great trade. So I implore anybody out there that's interested to look into it some more, get into this trade because we need your help. And, you know, it's a good career. So let's see what else. What do we got going in the chat? What am I reading through here right now? Seeing what I'm missing. Got a couple things I want to cover as usual. Um, let's see. Free on Leon says, we doing a braze training tomorrow morning. That's cool. I could use some braze training. So um, <laughs> Jason Johnson says, no free lunches in this trade. It has to be earned. <laughs> Scott Savage, how you doing today, bud? How are you doing? All right. Let's see what else we got going on in here. Um, Okay, let's see. Sean Leather says, loved working in the old body coolers. Creepy. Yeah, we we had a couple morgue coolers at the hospital customer. We had a four passenger and a two passenger. Uh, got some fun stories in those things. Told them many times, but we'll definitely probably tell some more. Remind me um, on the HVAC Overtime Show, I'll tell some of the funny morgue stories. I'm sure I've told them before, but we could tell them again. All right, so a couple things. Edward had asked me a question from a recent video, and he was very curious about changing pillow block bearings. And he's struggling to get pillow block bearings off of, let's just say, an exhaust fan, okay? And he wanted to know if I have any special tools or tips or tricks for getting pillow block bearings off of uh, existing equipment that needs to be replaced, right? Um, so, you know, first and foremost, when you are removing power transmission, bearings, pulleys, different things like that, right? When you're pulling the bearings off or the pulleys off, it's so important to make sure you understand that everything needs to be cleaned, cleaned and lubricated, usually with like a penetrating oil, right? There's several different brands of penetrating oil, but you clean the shaft up really good, put a penetrating oil on there, let it sit for a minute, uh, take a dead blow hammer, which is a hammer with sand in it, give that bearing a tap, just a couple taps on all different directions, try to break anything free. Um, and then what I can do when you're trying to take pillow block bearings off, and I know this is probably difficult to understand, but I'll try to use the force of the wheel or the exhaust fan. So I'll loosen the set screws on the bearing, but leave the, the, um, the, the pulley on top of the bearing on, okay? And leave the wheel connected down below the bearing that's connected on the bottom side of the shaft. Let's just say an exhaust fan, okay? So I'm going to loosen the set screws on the bearing. I cleaned up the shaft on both sides, put some penetrating oil on it. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the pulley from the top and I'm going to spin it back and forth. And what you're going to feel is you're going to feel the force of the wheel as you're trying to turn it. You're going to feel that has some weight to it, right? And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get that every once in a while, the back and forth to break that shaft free from the bearing. Sometimes that'll work, right? There is bearing pullers that you can get to, uh, pillow block bearing pullers that will you know connect onto the bearing and you can force them off those things work i currently don't own one uh what i personally do is if i can't get a bearing off if i can't clean it off if i can't use a little heat and and get the bearing to come off then i'll just cut it off with an angle grinder that's all that i do just very carefully notch the bearing out notch the shaft off or you know until you don't hit the shaft you don't want to hit the shaft when you're doing it just very very slight cuts and the bearing will come apart and then just clean up the surface, slide the new bearing on, then call it a day. That's usually what I do is just grab an angle grinder. You know, it's getting more and more rare that we're actually changing bearings on equipment because most of the customers opt to just replace the equipment these days. Most of the equipment out there is throwaway equipment. You know, it's not built to last anymore. Have you guys 
recently, okay, there's a major exhaust fan manufacturer that used to make what we called utility style exhaust fans. Utility style in my book is an exhaust fan that hinges up that can be, you know, uh, rebuilt many times. It's not an aluminum mushroom fan. Okay. So there's a company that used to exist called Supreme fans. They used to make some very high quality, uh, exhaust fans that were utility set fans and you could pull them open. You could change the wheels, the shaft. They were basically made out of giant, really thick gauge steel. They lasted forever. But as time goes on, 30 years, 35 years, you know, goes by the fans start to get worn out. When you try to get a replacement, one of those fans that's made by a new company. Now those, those fans are in excess of $20,000, $25,000 for an exhaust fan for some of them. It's pretty crazy how expensive they've gotten versus what they used to cost way back in the day. You can get a mushroom, one of the aluminum mushroom fans, you know, for uh, ridiculously cheaper than that, that really expensive fan that's going to last, you know, 25 to 30 years. So customers just tend to opt for the cheaper stuff these days. So it's very rare that I find myself changing bearings. Um, let's see what else. Yep. Supreme came with all the fixings. That's right. hundred percent. Uh, let's see what else we got going on in here. Um, reading through the chat, seeing what I'm missing. Clean, clean, clean says Steve from everything HVACR hundred percent. Um, hundred percent. Uh, you know, it's funny too. I was just talking to my buddy, Dave. Uh, he may or may not be popping into the stream. Dave G he's in here. Sometimes, uh, I was talking to him on the phone today because Dave is also, uh, runs business and, uh, we work for some of the same customers. So it's funny because I've been able to make friends with people across the country and just talk about problems that we have, you know, technical problems, business problems, and it's cool to be able to lean on people. So, Make sure you find that friend group, uh, that core group of people that you can always lean on because it definitely helps. You know, running businesses can be stressful to no end. And it's nice to have someone that you can bounce ideas off of. So I appreciate you, Dave, for always being there when I want to make a phone call and just, you know, yap at you. So uh, let's see. Jordan says he had an HVAC interview today and the guy was telling him manual N was for ductwork. I just Googled it because it sounded wrong. And apparently manual D is for ductwork. Yes. Manual N. Um, oh, wait. Apparently it's manual D and not manual N that is for ductwork. Yeah. Manual D is for ductwork. Manual N. Isn't manual N. Is manual N the diffusers? Like, I, I don't remember what manual N is. It might be the diffusers. I think that might be it. Someone in the chat confirmed that. So. Uh, those chemical rated fans are expensive. Yeah, I've never done the chemical rated fans for sure. Oh, manual ends commercial. There you go. That's what it is. Which one's the one for registers and grills? Which one's that? I can't remember. It's hard to keep up for all that stuff. Um, so, uh, Jordan, you actually mentioned or had asked a question about my recent video where I had a compressor replacement. You asked if I was able to, uh, well, you asked if I was able to dump out the compressor. Um, you know, that's a good question when it comes to Linux. I don't know. I can't remember because it's been so well, no, we did process a, a warranty compressor through them recently, but regardless, I have a video where I, uh, had a compressor that had failed. It wasn't pumping, right? It was making a funny sound from the top of the compressor. It sounded like something was bypassing and Jordan had asked a question, but many other people asked a question too, about whether or not I was going to be able to autopsy that compressor. Could I pour out the oil to analyze the oil, that kind of stuff. And that's a good question. I need to ask Linux. Uh, sometimes they don't even ask for the compressors back, though, because it's 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 going to be just a compressor only warranty. So they might just want a picture of it. And if they do, then I'll cut the compressor open and autopsy it and figure it out, figure out what caused it. But yeah, in that situation, a bunch of people had asked me in that video too, how come I didn't put in a Copeland compressor? It's because it was covered under warranty. Customer sent out another LG compressor, no charge. So I was like, well, you might as well take what you can get. Uh, yeah, I certainly would have loved to have just go ahead and put a Copeland in there, but I got to be honest too. I think more than likely the cause of the failure in that compressor has something to do with contamination and overheating. The customer doesn't do normal routine maintenance and it's very, very common for that equipment just to overheat like crazy run with dirty condensers for months at a time. So, you know, it is what it is, but you know, customer got it under warranty through their, you know, manufacturer. So it's all good. Um, Let's see. Uh, Big Nate says the diagnosis begins and ends with the name LG, sadly. Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, got to be careful. Uh, what's my opinion on the LG compressors? I mean, it's a compressor. It works. 
you know, as long as you don't abuse the heck out of it. Uh, when I cut them open, they're certainly very interesting the way that they work inside. But I mean, I have some pieces of equipment that I've never worked on and they've had the compressors in there forever. So, you know, it's just how you treat it, I guess. Uh, I don't know if it can take as much abuse as other brands, but you know, it is what it is. So, uh, let me read through the chat right now. All right, cool. Yeah, lots of great people in here. So lots of great people. Currently working on a VRF system. Previous company didn't braze with nitrogen, and now there is a refrigerant squeal at one branch box. You'd imagine something is getting plugged up. Any thoughts, anyone? Jared, I don't do any VRF work. I mean, it's possible, but um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of possibilities as to what could be the squeal in there. I, I mean, I guess, is that not something you could check pressure drops across? Is it not something you can compare to other um, other branch boxes that are operating under similar conditions, similar uh, refrigerant volume going through them? Is it possible? You know, I don't know. Those are things that I would try to research a little bit so that way you can investigate some more. Uh, but that's a good question. So, yeah, not brazing with nitrogen definitely causes a lot of problems. So, uh, let's see. Big Nate says Gold Star made cool VCR and 3DO game consoles. Yeah. <laughs> Gold Star is one of those big giant conglomerate or conglomerates. So for those that don't know, LG is owned by a massive conglomerate that used to be called Lucky Gold Star, which was the name of the company or Gold Star. Uh, now they're just known as LG and they manufacture all sorts of different stuff. Um, LG has a lawsuit for their home refrigerators. Compressors keep dying. Yeah, I did read that. And actually I'm in the process of purchasing a new home refrigerator and I steered away from LG because of the, the information that I had read about their compressors being a major problem. But if you try to steer away from LG compressors in home appliances, you only have one or two other options. So you got to kind of choose the lesser of three evils basically. Um, and it's been a pain in the paid in the butt we had a new refrigerator i wasn't home today delivered and it was damaged and uh, my wife sent me a picture of the side of it which was going to be exposed and open and had a big old ding in it and i was like not for the money that we had to pay for that piece of junk send it back so the guys had to take it all the way out put my old refrigerator back in and uh we'll try again on thursday again so all right let's see what else uh jimmy Phelan, what is up man thanks for becoming a channel subscriber channel supporter i appreciate that my good friend what's the best way to clean a micro channel evaporator with plain water if possible right plain water if you can get hot water go for it uh if you need to use chemicals be very cautious about the chemicals that you choose hopefully it's not covered in grease uh, i prefer to use uh refrigeration technologies um uh, yellow venom pack for micro channel condensers it's it's permanently or it's perfectly safe for micro channels the yellow venom pack or the viper hd cleaner does not etch the coils so that's my route but try with water first hot water first and if that doesn't get them clean then use cleaners anytime you can get away without using cleaners go for it but you know dealing with restaurants like i do you pretty much always need to use chem uh, chemicals to clean equipment because it's usually just beat up from the grease and different things on the roof and it just disintegrates everything. So just be cautious. If you guys uh, want to help support the channel, great way to do so is check out truetechtools.com. I have an offer code, big picture, one word. If you use that at checkout on most of the items on their website, you'll get an 8% discount. I get a small commission from that. And you can also purchase the refrigeration technologies, chemicals and the spray guns and all the different stuff that uh, refrigeration technologies makes. Uh, from truetechtools.com. So, all right, let's see what else. Questions and caps. Yeah, definitely. It definitely helps. Uh, let's see. What else? Did they route the piping correctly? Did they? Oh, okay. I see you're asking, answering that one. What's up, Pablo? How you doing, man? All right. Um, let's see. Daniel says he despises home warranty, but he does know it's an easy way to get work right away. Yeah. Warranty is always a pain. Um, definitely is. Let's see. Sean Leather says it's only related to a specific type of LG compressor. Yeah, it is their linear compressors, the ones that lay on the side. The, uh, is it, it's called a linear compressor, I think, isn't it? It's like the pancake one that's like on its side, correct? I think so, uh, is the compressor that they're having a problem with. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not familiar with uh, the LG compressor issue 100%. I just know it's it's one of those really small little ones, right? Um 
How would I get the ice out of a Hoshizaki machine that's connected to a soda machine? Steve Covington, there is no easy way to do it besides just holding down the silly ice button into a bucket. That is literally on a dispenser. There's no easy way to get the ice out, man. So just put a bucket under the ice thing, push the button, and just hurry up and wait and just let that stuff come out. And if it's not coming out and it's frozen into a giant block, you've got a headache on your hands. You need to let it self-defrost. Uh, I would steer away from pouring water into the ice hopper up in the top if you can get away with it because water is just going to make a giant mess in the convenience store or wherever this dispenser is at. Um, getting ice out of dispensers is just a pain sometimes. You just got to hurry up and wait. So, uh, Samsung has a problem with the insulation in the C. Uh, you mean in the cabinet? Let's see what else we got. Residential fridges. Get the cheapest ones with the least options. Yeah, you got to kind of weigh out some different stuff for sure. So, uh, do I do any residential? No, I do not do residential. Okay, a couple more questions. Uh, David, um, Oh, great question. So David had reached out. Uh, I take it, I'm paraphrasing his question, but from his question, he works for a nonprofit or does work for a nonprofit. And he was trying to find information uh, or he was trying to find a cheap package unit, like something used that he could sell them that I'm assuming sell them that way, you know, he can save them a couple bucks. So he wanted to know, he had an idea. He came across a package unit that was brand new, never installed, but the condenser had a hole in it and it had been flat on refrigerant for many years. So he wants to know he can pick it up for really, really cheap. It's right within their budget. He thinks he can repair the leak and he wants to know if he's going to run into any problems. So from what you're telling me, the system's been flat on refrigerant, meaning that it's been completely void of refrigerant for a very long time and it's had a hole in the condenser. What that means is that over time, uh, the refrigeration piping and the oil in that compressor has filled up with moisture, okay? Just airborne moisture. It's gravitated toward that. It has absorbed into that oil, and it's all throughout the system. So I don't suggest installing a package unit that's that old, but if you need to, you certainly can give it a shot. If I was to do it, what I would do is I would completely remove the compressor, get rid of it, get a new compressor, install it in there, dryer, if proper evacuation, recharge, and move on after you fix the leak, right? Uh, trying to dry out the oil, depending on what type of oil it is that was in there that had been sitting flat for years, just absorbing the moisture from the air is going to be a nightmare and you're going to create more headaches. So I'd strongly suggest not using the unit if you can. It was a used unit or not, you know, it was a it was a brand new unit that was damaged that it sounds like maybe it sat behind a supply house or something. I personally wouldn't install it, but if you have to, I would suggest putting in a new compressor for sure. Uh, maybe, you know, some good dryers in that thing too, for sure. Uh, oversized dryer, prey, exactly, 100%. Uh, Hamilton says that his son proposed to his girlfriend. He's 19, graduates high school in May. You think it's ridiculous, but the more you try to reason with him, the more determined he becomes. Hey, man, I have teenage daughters and uh, this is kind of steering away from the HVAC talk, but that's fine. You know, it's a conversation. You're having a chat in there. Um, yeah, that's a hard one, man. You know, you know, your family, you know, your, your kids and stuff. You got to make those decisions on your side. Uh, I can't really give you advice because my advice would probably be bad advice. Uh, the only thing I could say is, uh, you know, dads always have a hard time with everything. So just keep that in mind. I oftentimes have to remind myself to bite my tongue in certain situations. You can only do so much, but uh, hopefully your kids listen to whatever advice, as long as you're giving it to them in the right way that you can. So let's get on back with some HVAC talk. All right. Um, okay. So I talked about, or I, I mentioned that in a recent video where the exhaust fans weren't working in a building, that uh, we had changed a motor starter, and I noticed that there was something funky going on within the motor starter. There was an interlink for the makeup air unit built into the exhaust fan. And what, let me explain a little bit more. So we had a motor starter panel, right? So you had uh, maybe like five motor starters that were all wired together. You had a makeup air and then four exhaust fans, okay, right next to each other. And the power for the makeup air, it was 24 volts, ran through a set of contacts in each motor starter. So basically, if one of any of the four exhaust fans did not turn on, if the contactors did not pull in on the motor starters, then the makeup air unit wouldn't turn on. Uh, 
And I had actually bypassed that. And I mentioned that uh, it's typically installed because of a direct fired makeup air unit and they want to interlock so that way the makeup air only runs if all the exhaust fans are running, especially when you have direct fired makeup air units, that is a must. So a couple of people commented about it and said, hey, is it possible that that interlock had to do with the fire system shutdown? And that is a really good question, okay? So basically on a typical restaurant exhaust system, if there's a fire in the building, whether you pull the Ansel station, which is a fire suppressant, right? And it's a little mechanical device you pull and then it you know, releases a bunch of fire suppressant or fire retardant to slow down the fire, that kind of stuff. But they have a lot of electrical interlocks built in. And so someone was saying, hey, was that interlock that I bypassed part of that? Uh, no, no, it wasn't. Um, I don't have the schematic to show you guys. But if you look at the setup, that interlock literally didn't let the makeup air units turn on if unless the uh, exhaust fans had pulled in. There was actually... Um, I'm 99% sure on this because I'm sitting here thinking in my brain right now. I don't think it had to do with the uh, exhaust shutdown for a fire situation, okay? Because of the way that it was interlocked in there, um, I really don't. But I'm not going to be 100% and say no, absolutely not. I don't. I am going to investigate that a little bit more, but I'm I'm like 99.9% .9 sure it had nothing to do with that. So, um let me see. Is a makeup air interlock important? Yeah, definitely. It's there for a reason. Uh, my logic was was the uh, makeup air unit was not a direct fired makeup air unit, so therefore it didn't need the interlock for the exhaust fans. Now, I understand during a fire situation, we want to shut down the makeup air unit makeup air unit yes so that way we don't fuel the fire but we typically and it all depends on the setup and the design from the architect and the engineer and all that stuff but typically we turn on the exhaust fans in a fire and we shut off the makeup air and shut off all the acs so that way you don't fuel the fire and you actually suffocate the fire because the idea is is that nobody will be in the building the doors will all be shut the exhaust fans will try to remove as much air from the building as possible right it's never going to go negative but well, it'll go slightly negative, but anyways, that's a whole nother conversation for another day. So, all right, let's see what else we got. Um, reading through the chat right now. Total sex says I am his hero. Who man, you need to set your standards a little bit higher if I'm your hero, my good friend. So, um, Navax swaging tool worth it pros and cons. I have the Navax swaging tool. Sure. It's very beneficial. I like it better than the spin swages. Spin swages are a pain. Uh, there is a major flaw with the NAVAC flaring tool, though, uh, in that it does not flare, especially if it's old copper, uh, half inch all the way down to three eighths very well. OK, I'm sorry, it doesn't swage them uh, without cracking the pipe, especially if it's older pipe. So what you need to do is you need to put the swaging tool on there. You press the button, you let it go about. 40% of the way and then you push the button again it stops you release it you turn it 40 degrees and then turn it on again um, because if you don't it'll actually crack the tube and it's happened quite a bit the other downside to the navac flaring or swaging tool is that it doesn't have a quarter inch bit on it and i deal with a lot of quarter three eighths half inch pipe um, and that's kind of a pain so i still got to use the spin swage now the spin swage or the the swaging tools that go in a drill there's a couple different names for them those are kind of cool because they actually anneal the pipe so they actually spin so fast the friction heats up the pipe and then it makes it easier for it to swage the pipe but the issue i have with the spin type ones is it's really difficult to get the swage to be straight because your drill tends to go at an angle um, and that's just always a problem with me so uh, anyone seen totality today? Nope. Didn't see that out here in SoCal. Uh, I looked up like 10, 30, 11 o'clock. I didn't see anything and, you know, just a bright, bright sun in my face. So I didn't have any of the fancy doodads to look at it with your eyeballs or anything. So um, Navac one is good, says Ray. So, yeah, that's good. Uh, good guy says sold separately. Uh, yeah, I have the bender too, free on Leon. I honestly don't use it very much. I still use my hand benders, but I do use it occasionally. So um reading through the chat let's see total tech says the quarter inch hillmore hydro swage works for him right on yeah i need to i need some sort of quarter inch i mean i've been using the spin one for a while now so it is what it is all right let's see a couple more things do like oh <clears throat> excuse me good question so uh joseph conway 
asks me, do I feel like I am a good boss? And he says, the reason I ask is that people see me and interact with me. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. He's asking if my employees, because they see me and he's saying, do they interact with me in a different way? So the question is, the way that I portray myself on my videos, is that truly who I am? Or do my employees see me differently? I think as far as the person that I am and how I interact with my employees is a 50-50 mix between if you guys have ever watched me on the HVAC Overtime Show and everything you see here. So I am. I know that I'm the same person that uh, you guys see and the person that talks and everything to my employees that you see on this channel, but I also have a lot of personality in the way that I interact with them. And that comes, you know, that's the personality that you see on the overtime show. So I don't, but you know, I guess I can't truly answer that question though. I guess my employees would have to be the ones that answer that question because they're the ones that are going to say whether or not I'm just, I, I would like to say that I'm the exact same person, the crazy um, person that wants things to be as perfect as possible. I mean, I know that's me with my employees. I'm constantly saying, you know, I, trying to be nice about how I, I will tell them like, Hey, you know, I would have done this like this, but your way works too, like that kind of stuff. Um, so I'd like to say I'm the same person that you guys see, but I don't know. You got to ask my employees. So would I say my videos put pressure on them for quality work? Um, I wouldn't say my videos put pressure on them Freon. I mean, I put that pressure on them because the quality work is, is why I started making the videos. Again, to reiterate to people out there, Chipmunk, thank you very much for that super chat. I really do appreciate you. <laughs> I'm not an HVAC hero. Um, I'm just a normal person that's trying. But thank you very much for that super chat. Those are kind words. So, Freon, do my videos put pressure on him? I mean, the reason why I started my videos was because we screwed up as a company. We lost several employees in a very short amount of time, all for different reasons. But in my opinion, reasons we could have maybe saved a few of them had we changed a few policies and things that we did at the company. Basically, we were super busy. We weren't paying attention to the need of the employees. This is my perspective on, on what happened, right? And uh, long story short, we lost a few employees all in a short amount of time, right? So I found myself having to hire people that didn't quite fix things the way that I wanted them fixed. I'm very particular in the way that I want things done for my customers, okay? So long story short, I started making videos, showed the videos to my employees. They weren't originally supposed to be for the public, but shortly I made them that way after talking with some friends and the channel just became what it was. But the initial channel started as a way for me to show those employees, this is the expectations that I have. This is what I want you to do. So you go back to the channel. The very first video on the channel is me changing few or uh, trying to figure out for a couple hours why fuses had blown on an electric defrost walk-in cooler, okay? And I proceeded to take that entire system upstairs and downstairs apart, both evaporators, the condenser, analyzing everything, found multiple rub outs in the wiring, repaired all that, and have never since then had those fuses blow again, okay? So the expectation I was setting was that we don't change fuses and move on at this company. We figure out why the fuses went bad. OK, because we don't accept the fact that fuses just sometimes go bad here. OK, it just doesn't just doesn't jive with us. And if anything, I would be the person to make the decision on whether or not I thought a fuse went bad just because. And that's going to be basically after the employee or the person has told me they've gone through every single thing to try to figure out why and couldn't find it. Then I would consider letting it just be and seeing what happens. But for the most part, we don't just accept the fact that fuses go bad. So that's the whole idea from the channel. Um, let's see. Uh, do I like the eco fans? Have I had any problems comparing them to versus traditional blowers? I'm assuming you're talking about like the axial fans on like the carrier equipment and stuff, I think is what you're talking about. I don't know. I don't know what you mean by that. Um, what do I think about a standard squirrel cage and a PSC motor versus one of the new ECM or VFD driven or axial fan motors? I mean, you know, the old school part of me wants to say it worked. Why change it? You know, it was easy to work on whatever. But the more progressive part of me is like, look, 
everything's going to constantly change. You might as well embrace the change and, and make money from it as opposed to always trying to hold on to the thing that you finally mastered 15 years ago. You know, it change is inevitable. It really is. So we just need to embrace it. So do I like the fact, like, absolutely. Do I love all this new technology coming into the trade? I mean, there's a side of me that doesn't like it, but the other side of me is like, wow, this is cool. This is something new to learn something new. That's going to break that I get to fix. I mean, I'm a technician. I love fixing things. So, eh, you know, it is what it is. Um, reading through here, went blind from a full moon. <laughs> <laughs> oh man do i need to install ultra low nox package units on commercial applications in california i really i don't know i think it's going to change everywhere but yeah ultra low nox i believe you're supposed to be doing that on most of the equipment but what i will say is is i don't install enough new equipment and you know deal with the permitting process enough i i every once in a while do change outs but most of the time uh, general contractors are, you know, are dealing with it or facilities directors are dealing with pulling the permits and stuff. And then I'm sometimes just installing equipment for them. So I don't really know. I'm not super well versed in all the different codes, but I know low knocks is a really important thing here in Southern California, the California area. So I'm pretty confident that package units need to be some sort of a low knock setup, but I don't know the specifics of it all. So I'm um, reading through here. How do I find my technicians? Uh, my last technician that I hired uh, came from the videos. And actually, I'm about to announce that I'm hiring again. So I'm going to be looking for a new technician. I'll put it out on all my social media platforms. Uh, this time, I'm going to be hiring another person. Um, I'm willing to train an inexperienced technician that's had some sort of training, you know, just some sort of trade school, basic fundamentals. I can help to build from that. So, yeah, I'm going to be, you know, announcing it. And that's usually where I'm finding people is just by announcing it. Um, so yeah, but I'm also looking, you know, I mean, possibly for the right unicorn that's experienced as a technician, but you know, it's difficult to find the experienced technicians because oftentimes experience comes with bad habits too. And so it's just kind of a gamble. So I've had good luck hiring experience. I've had bad luck hiring experience. I've had good luck hiring apprentices and bad luck. It's just, every person's going to be different. So I can't assume that every single time I hire someone's going to be just the perfect cookie cutter, whatever, you know, that's why you start in a probationary period and, you know, you get to know each other. Um, and you know, with me, I want the technician that's going to come work for us to know our expectations right up front. I don't want them to be surprised, you know? So we give them a transition period where they get time to come, um, and work with us and, you know, and then we get to transition and work with them and, you know, just kind of figure out what works. Uh, all right. Reading through here. Mike B says he can do zoom. <laughs> uh, Brian Sanders says he wants to work remote. Yeah, I wish I wish. Um, Jimmy Phelan. Thanks for that. Super chat, man says my balance is spot on. When you're a boss owner, there's a fine line of showing employees too much buddy, buddy stuff, of course, depends on the situation. I have um, had employees that I became really, really good friends with, like really good friends with, and it's worked out. And then I've also had employees that I've been good friends with that went really bad. So it's a hit and miss. Uh, best case scenario, though, is that... Um, you know, supervisors, managers, service managers, and owners of companies need to be very, very cautious about being best friends with employees because it's a really difficult relationship. It really is. And so it's okay to have to be a work friend and have courtesy for each other and, you know, respect each other. But it's a very difficult thing to be best friends, uh, you know, just because there's just just frustrating things that happen, right? And so it's a fine line and it's going to be different for every single person. So um, let's see what else we got in the chat right now. Uh, even the owner can't work remotely. No, I can't. I can't work remotely. I just have to have my hands and stuff 100%. So um, let's see. Chipmunk says he has a pink unicorn mug and he is not an HVAC person. So he wants. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> you are too funny, my friend. You are too funny. Uh Let's see. Simon says he does remember me getting mad at the Bluetooth economizer controls. Oh my gosh. If you only saw what my employees saw with the Bluetooth economizer controls and the things that I said to that economizer that would probably get me put on death row. 
for what I said to that economizer. Um, yeah, probably get me in big trouble. Uh, let's see. Will Speed says his boss is a good friend. He's known him all his life. And he understood that when he's on the clock, he's the boss and not my friend. And that's a great point. But Will, I think you would agree that, you know, a relationship as a friend with a boss or as a boss with an employee is a, uh, a sensitive thing to navigate and it's a difficult thing to navigate. So, you know, and while it does, you know, and like I said, it's worked for me in the past too, but it's a struggle. It's, it's, it's not going to work for everybody. So it's something you really got to consider. Um, let's see. Uh, almost everything says, uh, you just watched my video on the compressor that was making a hissing noise. Did I ever figure out why it was making that sound? No, uh, there's got to be something stuck. I think the internal pressure relief's bad in the top of the compressor. The compressor is a warranty compressor, so I got to make sure that the manufacturer doesn't want it back, and I got to make sure that I get reimbursed for it. Once I get reimbursed for the compressor, if they don't want it back, then once the check clears, I'll cut that thing open, and we'll try to figure out why. But I don't know. I haven't figured out if they want it back yet or not. Um, let's see. During the unmentionable lockdown, the UK government told them to work from home. You miss your 10 mile long screwdriver. Oh yeah. Um, all right. Do I, okay. So I already answered that question. Okay. Um, my gosh, how many of you guys have expressed your opinions about my new intro I, I felt the need to have to cover this good grief you know it's like hit and miss you know i know that some people don't care i know that some people don't watch the intro that's fine right but i changed the intro on my videos uh the part where in a monotone vo voice i said this video is brought to you by spoiling right there's nothing wrong with it but it, i was just sick of hearing my own voice i really was my that that has always agitated me uh, is my new intro permanent forever? Probably not. I'll probably change it again. Um, I'll probably end up putting something back in where it's my voice or something like that saying spoiling. It's just got to sound different. I just needed change. You got to understand when I sit down, I do this multiple times a week. I have to sit down and watch each video multiple times, right? When I'm editing them and everything, I watch it and I hear that and I got to edit certain things out. And I just get sick of myself. I'm really sick of hearing myself. I don't even understand why you guys can continue to watch me because I'm sick of myself, genuinely. Like, ah, I just, I, I'm sick of my, vo my voice. Have I ever knocked on a trade school door for a possible employee, Greg Austin? Yeah, I've hired technicians from trade schools. Yeah, yeah, I have. I've interviewed technicians from trade schools. Um, certainly, yeah. And, and I know quite a few trade schools in my area. So trust me, when I put the information out there, uh, there will be people from trade schools and all sorts of stuff, you know, sending out a resume um, and they'll, they'll all know that I'm hiring because, you know, it, it word gets around pretty quick around here. So um, let me see. Uh, what is a good way to decipher a refrigerant issue versus a airflow issue? Um, Trey, so that's a really interesting one. So here's the struggle we have. And I'm, I'm going to talk on the commercial side. On the residential side, let, let me just talk about residential. On the residential side, really easy way. It's, it's rather easy to figure out an airflow versus a refrigerant problem on the residential side, okay? Because we have tools that can very accurately and very quickly measure total system airflow. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about the true flow grid from the energy conservatory. Okay. Um, I'm good friends with the energy conservatory. I have no other relationship with them other than that. Um, but I will say you can purchase their tools from truetechtools.com. If you like something again, use my offer code, big picture, you can get a discount at checkout on most of the items. And then I get a small commission. Okay. But with the true flow grid, you can put that on a home system and you can measure true airflow from the return going through the equipment, right? And then you can take a powered flow hood and you can go measure all the diffusers or the registers and you can figure out total airflow coming out of the registers. So between the true flow grid and a powered flow hood, you can figure out total system airflow. So you can do that. It does cost you some money. Those tools are an expense that you have to purchase, but once you get them, you can get a lot of information about a system, which makes it really easy as a technician to decipher whether it's an airflow issue or refrigerant related. Okay. The other way to decipher airflow versus refrigerant rated is by checking pressure drops, but you need data 
from when it wasn't a potential problem. So on startup of the equipment, or once the equipment's fully cleaned and operating properly, you should benchmark some data. Refrigerant pressures, air flows, pressure drops across the evaporator coil, filter, all this different stuff, and you log it down with the test conditions that you measured at, and that gives you a reference point for later down the line. Having historical data from in the past when this system was working properly goes a long way to helping you decipher issues. So back to the question, what are some tips for checking whether it's an airflow or refrigerant related? Proper tools help you to check the airflow. Once you have the airflow, then you can lean on refrigerant related issues, okay? That's the best way. Sometimes in residential, you can visually inspect coils and different things. On the commercial side, you can still check pressure drops, but there's a lot more variables that come into play. Using things like the true flow grid are a little bit more difficult on package units. It is possible, but it's much more difficult and the investment as far as financially is significantly higher. Same thing goes for flow hoods, measuring total airflow out of commercial package units and different things. The flow hoods are much more expensive um, and you know it can be a little difficult to get up to a lot of the strange equipment to measure the proper airflow, okay? Using fan tables and different things like that is a, a ballpark method of trying to decipher airflow, but you know fan tables are kind of confusing still. So, and there's a lot of variables that go into play. So it's not a really easy thing to do, uh, but on the residential side, it's a lot easier than on the commercial side for sure. So, um, let's see. Froggy says it's the quality integrity tradition, good values in trade that is so easy to it's running and run from it before it stops to be back next week. Um, I, well, I'm assuming you're talking about the intro. Yeah, definitely. Spoiland's tagline, quality, integrity, and tradition is still very, very important in this trade. And that's probably one of the better taglines, even though it's long, right? Uh, and it's a really long tagline, multiple words. It really, really outlines the values that we all need for sure. Okay. Uh, I mentioned it. Uh, people are seeing it on there. If you guys could please go do me a favor, uh, help out spoiling a little bit um they're trying to get their youtube traction up you guys know that spoiling has been a partner of mine for a very long time good good relationship with them good friends there lots of great people but we're trying to get their numbers up and stuff so if you could please go subscribe to the spoiling youtube channel um that would be great uh interact with them a little bit tell them i sent you um that'll uh definitely you know help them out a little bit they they do have some good information and one thing i will say um is uh, they've got some really, really funny information up there. Jim from Sporlin does, he's just hilarious. He, you know, he does such a great job behind the, being in front of the camera and the way that he interacts with the camera just makes me laugh. They do a lot of short form content and then they do long form training videos too, seminar type stuff. So definitely go out to Sporlin's uh, YouTube channel and give it a subscription for him. Okay. Uh, how many competing companies near me that are worth, uh, their stuff. Oh my gosh. Southern California has so many different companies and a lot of them are very good companies. So there's a lot of competition here. Um, and something that it just, it kind of makes me laugh and it's kind of, it is what it is. It's one of those things, but it's also very funny to find out that a lot of the competing companies, uh, watch my videos and continue to watch my videos. Cause I run into their employees all the time. And it is definitely something that is kind of funny and kind of disheartening in a way too. Like while I love helping other people at the same time, I'm helping my competition. So in a way I'm making the industry better, but at the same time I'm stabbing myself in the back because my competition that's literally bidding on the same jobs is getting tips and tricks from my videos. And it's just, it's one of those things, right? I, I don't regret, and I'm never going to stop giving the information out, but it definitely, I'm seeing it. Like, it's like, oh my gosh. Hey, we didn't get that job. That company got it. Oh my gosh, we didn't get that job. That company got it. And it's like, oh man, okay, interesting. So fun stuff. That's just a, a nice little tidbit right there, right? Um, all right, let's see what else. Uh, Freon Leon says, go corporate. Um, tell someone corporate to call me. <laughs> uh, let's see. Someone had asked me uh, the Makeup Bear unit, given the condition and how much work it needs in my recent video. Isn't it cheaper just to replace it? Replacing equipment here in California is so expensive for the customer. Most of the time they want to fix it versus replacing it because of all the BS they got to go through to change out equipment. Um, 
Let's see. Jordan says, I'm like the Tesla who open sources all its patents to help the world get better. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I can't say that I'm not that awesome of a person, but I definitely put a lot of information out there for sure. So um, has a has a place I've worked at ever burnt down because of the lack of cleaning? I can't say that's ever happened. No, uh, there's been restaurant fires before, but it has nothing to do with cleaning. Typically, I have had a restaurant. I take that back. I have had a restaurant had a wall catch on fire because there was too much grease in the wall because they had some duct leakage in a really odd place and they they did have an electrical fire that basically consumed the entire wall because it had grease in it so that has happened but that was a freak accident really um oh that's funny let's see that's too funny all right um okay let's see what else um Okay. You know, it's also interesting too, because sometimes people see, and I'm not criticizing, it's just a funny observation that I make because I see the comments, right? And I see them all the time. I can't tell you how many people watch my videos and will let me know, hey, you missed something. There was a spark here. Or there was a spark there. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're wrong. But it is just kind of funny that people watch my videos with such detail that they will like comment and be like, hey, you missed this. You made this mistake. You did that. And again, reiterate i don't care about criticism i'm all good for it you got something to help me grow give it to me but it is kind of funny sometimes some of the stuff that comes out um i already answered that one i already answered that one what gloves do i wear in my videos they're just whatever home depot sells they're like thicker nitrile gloves uh I, I don't know the brand it's just some cheap things nothing fancy at all because i go through them Sometimes gloves will only last me two, three service calls and they just get worn out depending on how intense that call was. So there's nothing expensive about the gloves that I wear. Um, and they give me plenty of dexterity. I can still move and do things with my fingers. Uh, in the recent video where I changed the compressor in the AC, what kind of valves that I have in line with the dryer? Those were ball valves. They were complete shutoff valves. With the compressor power disconnected, you can rotate those valves that will shut off the refrigerant flow to the dryer then you could recover the charge out of the dryer space then you could change out the dryer put a new one in vacuum down that small cavity put a little bit of refrigerant in there and start the system up without having to recover the entire system charge um, i don't do it all the time but on a situation where i question whether or not we're going to have a contamination issue it's a good idea to install ball valves for sure um yeah, exactly. No, I don't. Uh, Jason says, just don't be a jerk, basically, about criticism. 100%. I will never be a jerk about criticism. If you have something like I, I grow from criticism and there has been comments and things that were said nicely from friends from, I mean, even Jason, Jason Johnson, I wouldn't call it criticism, but you know, Jason's reached out to me and said, hey, there's a better way. Hey, you should check out this tool. It can help you with that. I've grown from things that Jason has shared with me, right? And Jason and I kind of became friends, you know, and we communicate with each other and it's kind of cool. Uh, so 100%, I am open to criticism. Um, and I'm not saying Jason was criticizing me, but in general, I'm open to that dialogue. I really am because it helps me to grow. And the same thing on the flip side, I wish more people were open to criticism because you know, I see people struggling with certain things or putting stuff out on social media, content creators, all that different stuff. And I would love not, I don't expect if I'm going to tell someone, but I would love to tell people my observations and my experiences with things. But it's interesting because a lot of the content creators, they get their feelings hurt really quick. If anybody just tries to say, Hey, that was kind of an odd way to do that or whatever. It's so funny. Like it, I have completely lost the ability to be able to share feedback and in air quotes, criticism to other people because I get accused of bullying people. And it's just, and I get it. I have a platform. So I have a little bit more, you know, people recognize me in chats and different things, but it's like, it's kind of sad because I can't just like share information. Like, and again, I'm not trying to be a jerk, but if I share the slightest bit of criticism with most of the social media creators out there, it, I just get accused of being just a big bully. It's kind of crazy. But I think we all could use to hear criticism more often because I think it'll help us all to grow for sure. Uh, let's see. Almost everything. Your home air conditioner, the compressor is extremely loud, 18 years old. 
Uh, when it starts up, does it sound like a squeaky trier trying to spin really fast? Is that normal? Uh, let's see. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. It doesn't sound normal to me, almost everything Apple. It really doesn't. It sounds like you guys need to really make in some considerations. If the equipment is 18 or 19 years old, it's basically on borrowed time. Uh, 18 to 19 years, I would love to say the equipment should last 30 years, but nothing made today is going to last 30 years like that. So as far as air conditioning equipment for residential. So it's it's a really good idea to have someone look at it, find a reputable company, have them dig into it a little bit more before it goes down in the middle of the summer. And then you're basically at the mercy of whoever can get to you fast enough. So just, you know, always try to be prepared for that stuff because air conditioning replacements these days are huge, especially with the advent of all the new technology and the equipment, because all that new technology is trying to squeeze out the most efficiency out of every air conditioner in doing that. Everything needs to be perfect in the system, airflow and everything in the past. We could get away with, cruddy airflow, low airflow, different things like that. But today with technology and all of our equipment, you can't get away with it. So oftentimes an air conditioning replacement, you know, complete system replacement in a residential home should be followed up with a complete duct renovation too, or done in conjunction because I'm going to go out on a limb and say 99.9% .9 of the duct systems in the United States on commercial and residential are done wrong and don't have the proper airflow coming out of them. And that's basically affecting all the, the new equipment and that's causing issues. So we all need to be looking into servicing our equipment more, checking the airflow properly and understanding when we're selling equipment as technicians um, that, you know, it's not just a simple change out anymore. It's a complete system retrofit most of the time. And that's a big expense. It is. So it's kind of kind of a rock and a hard place for the customers for sure. So um yeah, definitely got your money out, says Freon. That's a hundred percent. Yeah, that's that's definitely. Um Jordan says people aren't open to criticism. They may say they are, but it's impossible to get them to admit they're wrong, even when they're saying a reversing valve can operate back and forth minutes after shutoff yeah i don't know you know who knows everybody it just seems to get so upset and i'm not going to say i'm perfect i'm not some you know holy person that you know doesn't have issues just like everybody else i do but i i will say i i can 100 percent say i'm open to criticism um you just don't got to be a jerk about it you know when you're trying to be critical or share information with someone maybe they have incorrect stuff you don't have to be a jerk about it that is 100 percent but at the same time, people need to understand that, you know, you're not always going to be talked to like you're in a, a, a teddy bear party with, you know, soft walls and all that stuff. Right. I mean, sometimes there's some harsh reality and truth and, you know, people just need to not get their butt, their feelings so butthurt anymore. Right. Like they just need to get over it. Um, are, am I doing any more streams with HVAC school? Uh, Simon. I mean, you know, it's it's all about HVAC school. It's what they want, right? If you guys didn't know, I did a live stream with the HVAC school last week on Wednesday. Uh, they they invited me to be a guest on their channel. I mean, I'm sure, you know, if if you guys tell them that you wanted to hear about something, you know, send them a, send HVAC school a message and tell them you want me to be on the stream if you do. I I would love to be a guest on their stream again. And I mean, the you know they they basically have invited me. They've they've told me, you know, if I ever come up with any topics or anything, they you know, I want to talk about that. I could be a guest on the podcast or all that, um, you know, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to be invited again by them too. So if you guys have ideas or things that you want me to talk about on school, um, you know, shoot them an email over at HVAC school, send them a message or whatever. And, uh, you know, tell them if you want to hear something. So, um, let's see. All right, cool. Got a couple more things here. I already answered that one. Um, well, yeah, that's pretty much it. I went through all my lists. So I'm actually going to look at the chat a little bit more, interact with the chat for a few more minutes and see what you all have to say. Uh, what kind of licensing is required where I live? Also, how difficult is it to gain customer traction? Customer traction is a dumpster fire. It is a nightmare right now. There is no cookie cutter approach to getting into the commercial side. It's getting really difficult. Even as a small business like myself, I am struggling right now because... Uh, there's a lot of really, really big companies buying all the refrigeration companies, even my competitors, and they are squeezing me out basically. So it's a struggle. So I, I'm not going to pretend like I have the magic 
answer to that question because I don't have it. Um, let me see. What did I miss? I already answered that one. Uh, almost everything Apple says you got a good company in Lancaster County to come and check it before summer and winter. You want to change the thermos? Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, well, the carrier Infinity controller, almost everything, uh, you can only have that on an actual Infinity system, I believe. I don't think that'll work on a non-Infinity system. So what kind of licensing is required where I live? Oh, I didn't answer that one. Um, the licensing is... Uh, you basically have to have a contractor's license to run a business. As a technician, you only have to have an EPA Section 608 certification for the type or, or 609 if you're going to go into automotive. Um, but so as a technician, you only have to have an EPA certification. As a business owner, you only have to have a contractor's license, which says basically you've been in the business for X number of years. That's pretty much all the contractor's license is. And there's some other questions you got to answer. Um, but you do not have to have any kind of a mechanical license or anything like that to be an HVACR service technician in the Southern California area. Um, let's see what else we got going on here. Jason says C20. Yeah, that is the contractor's license. We hold a C20 and a C38. Um, all right, cool. Well, let's see what else is going on in the chat. What else have we got going on? I just got back from Vegas with my wife this last weekend. It was really nice. So... Uh, it was my wife's 40th birthday, and uh, for my 40th, I wanted to be like a little kid, and I rented out for like two hours. When I say rented out, it makes it sound like it's something fancy. For like two hours, we we paid a, a roller skating rink to only let us skate on the floor, right? So we rented it out for two hours, invited all of our friends for my 40th, and we went roller skating for two hours and ate pizza and crap like that. That was cool. And it was really cool, too, because... Um, you know, I was able to invite all my friends and then, you know, I just rented the place. It was cool. It was a lot of fun. But um, for my wife's 40th, she wanted to go to Vegas and do the adult thing. Right. So uh, we planned this. Uh, we stayed a you know decent place and had a really good time. We did a lot of off strip stuff. If you guys don't know about Las Vegas, you have the Las Vegas strip. That's where all the main casinos are. It's chaotic. It's just just chaotic on the strip okay so you're you're better off staying in hotels going from hotel to hotel but the strip is just a nightmare of craziness you definitely need to walk the strip once or twice in your life but you know after you've done it once or twice you really don't want to go go out there anymore because it's an experience but we did a lot of off strip stuff went and explored different parts of las vegas that we'd never been to it was a really good time it was nice to get away it had been a long time since i was out with my wife for a true vacation. I mean, we were only gone for three days and that was crazy. Like, you know, it was just crazy. Uh, we haven't done that in so long. So it was very nice. We had some friends go with us and it was just a great experience overall. Um, let's see. Fremont. Yeah, we spent a little bit of time in Fremont. We did not do the sphere. Um, I don't think I can handle the sphere because I get motion sickness and I just, I feel like I'm going to get sick in that place. So uh, what we did was uh, we went to, we did go to a show, dinner and a show. That was kind of cool. And then uh, we stayed at just normal room at Mandalay Bay. And then we went to uh, their supper club, which has like dinner and a show. And then we, uh, we went, let's see, did we go? Oh, we went to the Neon Museum. That was cool. Neon Museum is basically all the old lights from all the hotels that have been closed down over the last 50 years. And they saved them all. And they're setting up this whole thing. I think they're moving to a bigger facility too. But yeah, that was really cool. We did the Neon Museum. And then we did a couple country bars hanging out. We went uh, to the Arts District and walked around all of that. That's like a whole new place that's being built up. We did the uh, Fremont Street. Yeah, we just did a lot of off-strip stuff. It was a lot of fun. So uh, let's see. Oh, cool. Dennis says he's heading to Circa on Thursday. That's awesome. Yeah, we really enjoyed it for sure. Um yeah, Dave Johnson says uh, kind of like Bourbon Street because Dave Johnson's from New Orleans. And yeah, Bourbon Street, you know, once I would imagine once or twice, you're good to go. You don't need to go back. So, um, yeah, it's pretty neat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Scott, yes, yeah, Scott Savage. Yes, the strip in Vegas is a lot of debauchery for sure. So they've cleaned it up a lot. It used to be really bad and unsafe to walk the strip. It's safe now. There's still a little bit of chaos there and stuff and people trying to sell you stuff. But, you know, for the most part, it's not too bad anymore. Have I ever considered exploring opportunities in a different sector of the industry, such as working for a manufacturer 
or in education. Uh, total tech. Yeah, I actually have been thinking about that a lot lately. Um, I don't know how to proceed with something like that, but I certainly would be interested in working uh, for a manufacturer or education somehow. I would love to be some sort of education, but I have a lot of problems with the, the lack of pay in education and stuff. So yeah, I'd totally be down with doing something, but I'd still want to interact with people on social media and the internet and YouTube and stuff. So we got to figure out a way to make that all work. But that's definitely an option that I've been trying to figure out how to make work for a very long time because I genuinely love this and I love fixing things and training and different stuff. So I just need to figure out how to do it. So um, NAB is broadcasters and engineering and stuff or engineers and stuff. Oh, okay. That's cool. That sounds really interesting, Dennis. Uh, what kind of thermal camera do I use in my videos? But the Fleur, oh, you bought the Fleur E5 because of my videos. Yeah, I, I the Fleur E5, uh, I've had that one. I gave it to one of my employees. I, I think I've even given one of those away. Um, cool camera. So I have a Fleur 1 Pro that plugs into my phone. I do have that. I haven't used it in a while. I actually haven't used that since I've gotten an iPhone. But I also have a, uh, a Hick Micro M30, I think. It's a handheld camera. Um, rather expensive, but it's a nice quality camera. Uh, and that's what I've been using a lot lately, uh, is the Hick micro. The Hick micro doesn't do as good as far as content goes, as far as an HVAC content creator. Uh, the Fleur one pro is pretty much the best you can find right now, as far as the, the proper footage that transfers to a video, uh, with the Hick micro, it's kind of a pain to get the video and it's in the wrong format and it's just a pain. So, but, um, haven't tried the Hick Micro Pocket yet. Uh, Jordan says, when a Copeland compressor is bypassing on either internal bypass, will it ever make a loud clanking, banging sound or just hissing? I don't think clanking and banging would ever be anything. Um, I don't know. That's that's not going to be anything that's normal for sure. Uh, that, that's, that's a problem <laughs> for sure. Um, let's see what else. Uh, you guys have questions or things you want to talk about? Throw them in caps lock in the chat. Yeah, the term slug is something that is is kind of something you know that doesn't really happen with scroll compressors. It doesn't happen with most modern compressors because they have safeties built into them. You can definitely have effects of liquid refrigerant coming back um, or a large quantity of oil coming back at one time that can affect the compressor. But the fact that it's going to internally explode on a scroll compressor is pretty difficult to do. Um, not saying it's not possible, right? I mean, you abuse something, but under normal conditions, it's not something that's going to happen as much as, as people think it will. Um, can I fix micro channel coils? It is something you can do. Uh, it's not going to be pretty for the most part. It's typically going to be pretty ugly. Uh, but it is possible to do it. I've attempted with success before and with no success before. So every time can be different. I've never had anything on video that has been successful for sure. So um, right on. Good to see everybody. Um, let's see what else. All right. Well, it is time for me to go too because I think I'm going to go find something to eat and hang out with the family for a bit. So I really do appreciate you all coming in here. Um, thank you so much. If you guys haven't seen the episode that I did with HVAC school last week, go check out the HVAC school YouTube channel. Check out the last live stream. Uh, it was a pretty good one. Had some good conversations about commercial maintenance for air conditioning systems, split and package units. It was with Brian Orr and uh, one of his employees that worked for him. Forgive me. I don't remember his name. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Adam and um, oh, gee, many Christmas the new other co-host of the HVAC school show. Gosh, darn it. He's co-host with Adam. I'm so sorry. I'm forgetting your name right now. But anyways, it was a good episode. Definitely go check it out. Thank you so very much, everybody. I'm going to queue up the outro music and I'll uh, bring the pups in here in just a few minutes to hang out and uh, say hi to everybody. So let's go ahead and uh, open this up. What's up, Ike? My good bud, Ike's in here. How's it going, man? Um, yeah, just queuing up the outro music right now.
So I'll cue up the music in a minute. But this is funny because my dog Rory, when I call her in here, come here, sweetie. Rory, come here. Up. She like she runs in my office and she jumps on my lap because she knows that she's coming in here to say hi to everybody. She knows it. And so does Luke. Luke's right here too. It's my other pup. Come here. Come here, buddy. No, not Rory. This is for Luke. Come here, buddy. Oh, this is my buddy Luke. Luke, oh, he says hi. Luke is a silver Labrador retriever. Um, got him a couple years ago. A lot of the people that have been OG watchers, they they watched him from a puppy being a big giant monster like he is now. This is my big boy right here. He's a good boy. Good boy for sure. Rory is his little sister. She's an Australian shepherd, and she is the devil's spawn. Come here. Come here. But she is a sweetheart too, but she is the devil's spawn. This dog was sent here as punishment for everything I've ever done wrong in my life, but I love her to death. So it's one of those things. You just can't get rid of her. You love her, but she digs holes. She does everything. She antagonizes Luke. She's a pain in the butt. So, but she's a good girl. All right. I'm going to cue up the outro music again. Thanks so very much. We will catch you all next time.